So hello everybody, welcome to TSC meeting. Uh, today we're going to discuss two uh, subjects. Uh, uh, first of all, Ian's going to share with us a proposal for how we use JIRA for really sense screen planning for ONOS, uh, something similar that she's working with with CORD. And then afterwards we're going to have a discussion on uh, some of the outstanding issues and concerns uh, prior to deprecating the palm files uh, as we move from Maven to Buckville. So with that, I'm going to pass the buck to uh, Ian to uh, start talking about the first subject. Is that right? Okay. Then you should be able to share your screen now. Boom. And um, here. There we go. Yeah, there's a little bit of a lag. Oh, yeah, so during the screen and going to full screen mode is a good idea. I think Bob wants to do it. Yeah. No, it was working out where they have the presenting. Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to click on got it and then you get to go. All right. So, um, Here's just a quick proposal on some things we could do in terms of uh, changing how we use Jira. I've been looking through uh, the Jira user stories. Let's just say I get a bit lost. I think that is context is not. So one of the proposals for uh, Jira is the use of versions to drive a prioritized list of features um, for us to deliver on. Right. So in talking with some folks, I think there are questions around, okay, what's the prioritization of, you know, what we're trying to deliver? I think right now we're very component based. We're going to take each component and we're doing stories based on that. Well, all the stories theoretically tie to something. And so the current approach as we're looking at this is, okay, let's start from the top. So for each really planning session, focus on, you know, identifying the version and then identifying the epic that we'll use as features uh, that we plan to release with. The second part is today the epic that we're using can be very component focused. So take the epic and use them to capture features instead. Um, features may span in sprints, right? We have a prioritized list of epics that will be established as part of the release plan. And then this will drive a prioritization of what we deliver for each of the uh, releases. Components. Jira actually has the concept of components. Uh, components, sorry, the examples I have are all uh, core and things that I've been working on. But um, components are, right, the Northbound APIs, um, some of the intense stuff, right? Um, so these are things that we can use to flag the user story to identify what is needed. So, for example, um, if you look at deployment, in order to do some of the deployment work, like the VTLS integration, um, they needed additional intent. Well, in order for them to do that, they would have stories within those features that would identify intent. Um, and so what you have is you have a prioritized as a vertical that goes through the system and you're working on that in order to deliver. Uh, user stories. Um, user stories would essentially be the same. Um, user stories would document all the work except what we would do is the user stories associated with an epic would be focused around delivering a feature. Um, User stories are intended to be scoped to fit within the sprint. A uh, user story with the story point guidelines, um, as they refer to now, which you don't see, but is essentially what's listed in terms of um, how many story points uh, in order to do something, right? I think five story points a week. Um, the other thing that I'm hoping to do is as part of release planning, right? We're working on a feature, so we're all working together to define what all the pieces needed to deliver a feature. Traditionally, what happens is a scrum works together to identify how many story points for each story. This way, different people can help each other out as you know, things get tight in order to get things done. So you're not, based on, your, your subject matter expert is going to explain what needs to be done. And then as a team, you're going to look at it and say, okay, well, this is how many user stories and what it does is it, it apply, uh, provides the average that it needs in order to get something done. Um, the last part of this is the test and acceptance guidelines. Um, associated, ideally what you want is you want test and acceptance criteria associated with the user stories, right? Both the unit test level as well as the feature test level. 
Um, we don't have a lot of QA folks, right? It's really very hard working, but she's going to have a problem getting to all of her user stories. And so that is going to create a, um, a essentially a, a bottleneck where we won't be able to finish off the user stories. So what we should try to aim for at this point is have the QA requirements as part of the epics or features. And so that will gate us from releasing any features without an accept, uh, acceptable level of quality. Right? Um, other things that we may want to capture as part of our acceptance criteria is being able to document the API. Um, so some of the documentation requirements, some of the you know, needed testing requirements, so those could all be captured. Um, and we may have to capture these as uh, like some tasks and ethics. We don't have some of the plugins today uh, in Jira that would allow us to do so this is kind of a general change to how we're doing things. Uh, it's a proposal. So questions, comments, thoughts. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, so for the uh, so you were mentioning that uh, we have to capture what needs to be tested as part of each feature. Uh, so would you be capturing as part of the story, even though I know that QA might not be able to check this, but then do we want to just document them as part of each user story? Uh, as part of the epic that would be user stories associated to a documentation. So you would have to close out all the user stories in order to close out the feature. Okay. So, I mean, ideally, in, in sort of a user story should be self contained, also, right? In the classical agile. Yes. But I think what we're drawing is a little bit of a compromise here. Yes. So the user story, so in terms of development, developing the feature can proceed, but then the overall epic itself needs to be QA. So there needs to be basically a set of tasks or potentially QA oriented mm -hmm. stories to sort of make sure that the quality of that feature is assured. Okay. Um, but well, uh, maybe in a hypothetical situation. So let's say that feature is really complex and there might be like lots of use cases or scenarios mm -hmm. to be tested. Probably sometimes maybe there is there are so many features in the particular release, probably we might not be able to achieve all all those tests. So that's what my concern is like how do we capture those scenarios and uh, where do we document them that we will be like moving out from the uh, user epic, I mean, sorry, epic or feature. So the phase thing is just that. Yes, right. Yes. Yes. There could be some scenarios like that. So I'm just. So I think that's where the prioritization kind of is. Theoretically, you want to make sure that your highest priority. I think there are additional cases where maybe there's the HA aspect of it that we may not want to do with our conversation test, right? But to me, if we can't test it, it's kind of hard to say it's a release feature. You can say, okay, it's a feature maybe without HA. Okay. So if it stays in your feature, okay. I think probably maybe this is like yeah. there's more issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of this is just going to be a discovery process. So I think yeah. presently, yeah. Yeah, presently we're running a really disconnected. Right, uh, sort right. of a, I mean, the QA is kind of like playing catch up, right? We're just getting to covering the sort of problem areas. And I think the idea here is without going terribly overboard and attaching QA requirements to every story, this is sort of a compromise step where we're sort of drawing in QA closer to the development in terms of at least under the release of a specific feature, there should be some level of QA done on that. that. Now, the question is some, and it's, yeah, right? And yeah, so we yeah, need to yeah, agree yeah. That, that QA can always be potentially in, improved later on, and whether or not we extend the life of the feature, uh, or whether we schedule it as additional work somewhere else. I don't know. I think that's what. We, that's okay. ambiguous, but that's acceptable rather yeah. than you know. Yeah, yeah, or something. Yeah. And uh, the yeah, uh, I guess. So I think at the very least, even if we just have a story in the backlog that says this feature needs to be tested, at least you know there's a task. And even if we don't get to it for another release, at least it's there. And if someone is looking, it's like, oh, I'm looking to write some tests for them, they can like look through the list of things that. 
the focus is to figure out how we use the JIRA so that it maps to um, more of the logical. Uh, logical. Yeah, yeah. So I think what you described is a problem of right. columns and rows. And, you know, I think in here we basically, the tool sort of chooses a row oriented. Right? So the, the epics basically is a group of user stories under which the work can be tracked. Uh, but you could, but you could also, you're right. You could also look at it as a certain user story requires certain sets of features underneath it. The thing is, we just chose to map the features into epics as a as a set of related work towards a sort of a high level goal like support of EPLS. Yeah, I, I think that's. I, I don't. I haven't really noticed that happening. I've I've more seen the the epic design as sort of, you know. Like you said, closer to components, but not just components. It actually is a is a cross cutting cutting you know, horizontal organization of the whole system into interest areas and into usually kind of sub work groups, which makes a lot of sense to me actually. That, that you know, like over time, we want to have a high quality system, but it's also a work group and it's and it's also sort of collects things under sort of a logical umbrella of where we want the system to go in the long run. So I, I, you know, I think uh, it's, it doesn't map well to the idea of a feature. I don't even think we're using it currently as a feature. I think uh, stories tend to be closer to features, but even though those aren't, we're, I mean, we're sort of abusing the whole system in a way that really confuses me deeply. Um, but it seems that a logical, logically a story should be a story, and that tasks should be tasks, and that you know, features should be features, not, not confusing them in some strange way. So um, from a productization standpoint, right, so as you're uh, advertising your product, it's usually made up of a um, series of features. So this is the team that created Jira, and this is uh, kind of their map. Epics are significantly <coughs> larger. Epics are feature level work that encompass many user stories. Okay. So um, with the product you have this set of features, and in order to deliver each of the features, there's a set of things that are needed to be done to do that. I think what we're bound by is you look at the concept of agile user stories and to be done with things different. Right? And so it's a more bounded piece of work. Whereas your epics are intended to span and sprints and releases um, to provide a larger functionality that is customer visual. And so, so the, the idea is to bring our usage of the tool more in line with its intended usage, which um, which will reduce some frictions that we've been having. This, this doesn't really make sense at all to me. Like the uh, the epics are. The, the fact that an epic could be a set of user stories makes a little sense, but features seem like requirements for user stories. Yeah, right? it's, it's, like the thing is, it's like the hierarchy of Sure, I understand. I mean, we're talking about features is a highly overloaded term, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so I think what they're using, this is being used in a specific. I think they, they might mean, you know, kind of high level features or high level components or some, something like that, rather than, you know, feature is like, oh, at, you know, any, you know, bandwidth intense or something that seems like a feature. And that seems like something we can advertise. And say, oh, our next release has feature X, right? Whereas, um, you know, so so nomenclature aside, is there any is there any sort of uh, other sort of suggestions or <laughs> objections? Oh, um, um, sorry, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, or just a clarification. If you go back to the slides for a second. Um, so, I guess. The components thing um, is that I haven't seen that in, in our Jira. Um, more of a label, or it's not a label; it's something else. Yeah, it wasn't the component feature. Maybe you could explain. Something we filtered out. Yeah, it's something that was not turned on. And so, what you okay. do is just in your story, you can actually specify the component field. Okay, so it's like a new type of thing, which is a container for Epic. Maybe it's no, it's separate. It's essentially a label. 
It's a label. It's, it's okay. It's a label. It's a label, but it's not a label. Labels it's a label. It's not an epic. It's that row column type thing. Yeah, but it's another cross cutting organization. Yeah, that's more temporary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Because the thing is, is this is the version change here? Because we do tag the effects version of a particular bug and skips. Well, I guess our usage of effects version for stories is kind of dubious. And, and then the thing is, we don't usually right? in, introduce the fixed version until an issue is resolved. Yeah, because if you done. introduce it too sure. early, then when you generate the release notes, it yeah. well, that's there's probably a deficiency in the release notes plugin, but there's an effects and a fixed, right? This is which yeah. So I think the I think the the fixed is when it's actually done, and I mm -hmm. think the effects would be. So that uh, makes a lot of sense for me from the perspective of a bug, but how? What's the proposal for from the perspective of a? I was well because it's like what you want is almost a third one, which is like a target version, right? Yeah. So I was assuming that we would be using the effects version in context of the target. But if there is a target oh, yeah. version, we should I, use that. I thought there was a target version. The, the problem is today, uh, what we set up will actually not expose it on the epic. So in the research, sorry, I'd have to take it out. Okay. Sorry, I, I mean, I, I was but, just looking for yeah. clarification of where that where that But the idea is definitely yeah. you do not want to overload the, the, the fixed in or whatever. Uh, the, the fixed version. The fixed version should not yeah. be overloaded. Okay. There needs to be something. Yeah, it will be. So there's okay. something else that really seem to make sense, which is, you know, you say epics will be prioritized within each version release, but the reason that doesn't make sense is that, you know, you, you may have multiple features which can be part of multiple epics, right? And they, and but an epic may have a lot of high priority things in it and a lot of low priority <laughs> things in it, and so deciding which things you want to do is based on the sort of the relative priority within the epic, but you might have a low priority thing in the current epic, which is lower priority than something else in another prior in another epic. So it, you can't create like a linear ordering of prioritizing epics, like which is more important, testing or documentation. I mean, I but but you, what, you can though, right? I mean, so it depends on how you how you how you size the buckets, right? So the epic, the, the grouping here is entirely of our choosing. So um, so you could potentially segment if you have potentially staged approach to introducing an overall feature in long term. But since it's three different stages, then you could separate the work into three separate, uh, three separate epics, and each of those epics you would have the work that's required to accomplish that. And yeah. then you can so call it done and move on to the next. Yeah. Stage. So what you're suggesting is, it seems a bit unfortunate in that you're saying you would, that in order to solve the problem, you you'd split the epic into like high priority, um, medium priority, and low priority, right. something like that, which which doesn't seem like a good use of the. I mean, good approach at all. Well, then, then you, you, the, the, if you create a big epic, then yeah. it's not done till it's done, right? And so yeah. it's really just a judgment. I'm, I'm not. I mean, you, let's say you yeah. might want to introduce um, security. You want to you, you want to introduce authentication, okay? But not authorization. Uh, so we introduce authentication first. It's certainly a useful thing that people should be able to use in production without using authorization. They just don't have authorization. But overall, our security long-term goal includes authentication, authorization, and potentially even auditing. Right, right, right. But I, so I guess, we want to stage it. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, you might have like you know high priority. You know, if you it, unless you and you relatively prioritize the thing, unless the buckets are priority units, right? Yeah, but the That's thing is, within the thing, backlog, within the backlog, the items are prioritized. The so user stories will be prioritized, and so they'll have priority within that anyway. So we can use that. Yeah, well, I think if you if you ignore the prioritization of the of the epics and just and then you know it would be fine. But in which case, I would argue, why have it at all? That's sort of sort of my point. That the, the, the priority of things may, may interleave across epics, and if you strictly segregate the epics, then you can't reflect that. Whereas our current system is very nice that you, we can prioritize things rel in a relative fashion across epics, which is super nice because that enables us to deliver like a coherent set of features that are actually the high priority features. And so saying, oh, we need to do authentication before we do authorization, or we need to do authorization before doing permissions or something like that. Well, it's, it's like, just in a way, the buckets are drawn. So, um, so we can, so I think there's a way to avoid those dilemmas of things so by drawing the buckets appropriately. Yeah, but that's, that's the problem I see is that if you, if you introduce a strict prioritization of epics, 
then the ethics aren't sort of logically coherent things. Instead, they're sort of units of priority, which but I think sort of complicates things. But in the tools, though, the ethics are not prioritized. This is just a conceptual prioritization. Right? In the tool, the ethics are not prioritized. Right? If you select a version, you have a list of ethics. And so, say, you could make that a right? You could use that well, as long, as, as long as it's okay to ignore the epic prioritization, I'm saying it seems to be fine. If the epic prioritization is the time that it's just a guideline to think about it, like, oh yeah, for this release we're going to work on X, and that's kind of our higher priority overall. As long as that's just sort of a mental thing, like, oh yeah, we want to do that, but then within it, you can say, well, actually, Y and Z are also important, so we'll push them ahead of some X tab. Going to how, right, um, normally what we're going to be bound by is QA. What the prioritization will help us do is be able to say our higher priority things, and so from a QA standpoint, we really need to focus on. I understand that there are lots of people in our week now that are possibly disparate things during other ethics. And those can still continue. So, what we're saying is, as an organization, we're saying that these are higher priority and needs to be released. And so, whatever we're resource bound by, that needs to have priority in terms of focus. Yeah, that doesn't really address what I was saying, but I think we should probably move on. Okay. So, my, my thought was um, I would like to, I mean, unless there's objections to this, I would like to start following this process in uh, what? Uh, I'd like to start following this process for the J release just to try it out. Not try it out, but just to embark on it and then we can refine it as needed later, right? Starting in December? Starting, basically starting in December, yeah. So, it should, be, it should be hopefully enough of a sort of an announcement of the intent. Of the intent and Will the card follow similar? <coughs> yeah. This is actually yeah. patterning cord. This is, this is actually the creative cord. Cord isn't like this. No, it isn't. <laughs> no, it's no. Cord, and now we're lovely. I think we could, the, the, the honesty could benefit. Thank you. Well, I just want to say, I mean, I think I think there are a number of you know pitfalls, but those will probably become obvious. You know, yeah, so we can I think I think so. Yeah. Fix them as you go. Uh, yep. All right. So I think thank you very much. This is good. I think with that we can probably move on to the next portion, which was a discussion on uh, sort of concerns and uh, remaining issues with uh, with the uh, Maven two buck. Uh, Transition, thank you. I'm going to steal it. Short screen. Okay, so we didn't take any notes here. Unfortunately, I was bad. So the link to the presentation? Yeah, we can do that. I'll let you do that. Perfect. Okay, so on uh, the, so as everybody's aware, um, Brian and I and a number of others have been working on migrating the Onos build from Maven to Buck, basically pretty much the entire uh, Hummingbird release, and actually even prior to that. And uh, the Hummingbird was released using Buck. Um, the 171 was also released using Buck. Uh, so while there is uh, still <coughs> some remaining work, we would like to uh, start Cutting um, support for Maven because uh, we're beginning to experience a number of issues where the bug and <coughs> Maven are departing from each other and it's becoming more and more difficult to keep them in sync. And so uh, the whole point is to discuss what uh, some of the outstanding pieces of work are. Mm -hmm. What are the sort of the what is the if there were any processes or sort of expectations before with Maven to make sure all of those uh, expectations are met or figure out how they're met in the backland and then figure out where we go from there and when we can actually put the big DB button on the palm files. Um, just a disclaimer, not all palm, palm files clearly will be deleted. There will be a couple, just a handful of palm files that will continue to be maintained for the purposes of supporting external Maven built applications. For example, like the Onos dependency uh, palm, 
which contains an inventory of uh, of the third party components that uh, almost depends on will still be available as a maven artifact and it should hopefully significantly uh, reduce any pain for projects like code or others uh, that may be currently using that uh, or extending that on well, right now, uh, some of the some of the core applications are relying on Onos dependencies, right? Yeah. And Onos base. So Onos base would be kept. Onos dependencies would be kept. But just not the whole. So basically, what we what we're keeping is the dependency listing. What we are not, what we want, what we want to stop maintaining is the, the hierarchical structure of the palms uh, as a build as a set of built instructions. What we're saying is. Not that it's going to make core home on that's life better. You think that their life it's, it's not going to make it any more complicated. It's not going to change. It's not going to change is what I'm trying to say. Yes. And presumably, if they want to, they could migrate away from that in the future. Sure. If they want to. Absolutely. Yes. So, so the so kind of the basic usage models are um, so clearly Onos is going to be built entirely using Buck, using the Buck command. With one artifact, the 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 uh, well, with one exception, the Maven Onos project uh, archetypes that we have that provided uh, to create sample skeletal applications will still be built using Maven because Maven makes it really simple, and they're built only very um, very infrequently. Uh, Presently, the, the Maven archetypes also build projects with ARMS to enable building those standalone applications using Maven. We will eventually, over time, extend those archetypes to also include bug build files, so that if the project chooses to be built by a bug, it can do so. Uh, so that's sort of on base. space. Uh, now, for external, on or external applications, you can either have external applications built by Maven, by bug, or by something else. The idea here is to enable external applications to build either using Maven and or Buck. Right. So today, um, assuming that let's say a lot of the external applications have been started using sort of bootstrap using the Maven archetypes, they are today built using Maven. And so we clearly want to allow them to continue to do that, um, but in order for them... So, so for a Maven project that is built against a released version, of Onos. It's no problem. There's no problem. There's no problem. The, the, artifacts, Sorry. the artifacts are in Maven Central as you'd expect. Yeah. The yeah. question becomes when you have an external application that is built against uh, local artifacts. Yes. And mm -hmm. so um, Buck already has facilities to publish art, art, uh, artifacts through remote repos, which is what we use to publish uh, to release 1.7 and 1.7.1. Um, there's like three lines of code that can be added, which just tell it, don't publish these to remote repo, publish them to your local M2 repo. Um, I've got a prototype of this. I'm going to submit it as a feature request, or a pull request upstream to Buck guys. And um, we can also build it into our Onos Buck thing. Um, but so that's the first. This will just enable you to, to install lo your artifacts locally. Um, if you want to install local artifacts, or use lo local artifacts in external applications or Onos applications, um, Buck can either reference artifacts from the internet or it can reference artifacts from within the project directory you're currently working in. And so the workaround is if you're going to build local artifacts, you have to copy them somewhere. Uh, you can copy them into lib or, or wherever you want, really. Uh, and then just add a pre-built jar rule that introduces this new artifact into the Buck environment. Um, so it's, it's a two-line or three-line of Python uh, thing to uh, to uh, your buck file. Now these things aren't going to get checked into Onos, but you could use them for local testing. Before stuff gets checked into Onos, master, you've got to be relying on on uh, on released artifacts anyway. So, so it's sort should, of a, yeah. sort of a moot point. By the time it gets released, you just the reference becomes uh, to to a, a, to a uh, released artifact. Yeah, and this is akin to basically the current dependency in. Uh, Um, I think as far as these three usage models go, um, we've got, I think, uh, a solution for the Maven apps and fairly straightforward workarounds for the Buck-based projects. Um, 
But if there are usage models that we're missing, um, I guess it would be a good opportunity to, to bring those up now. So you guys see any other sort of a usage model that you have in your learning kit? For that, um, I, I mean, building an external neighboring yeah, I'm going to add it almost here. What do I care about that? So you have uh, an app that's not part of the Ono source tree. Yeah. Uh, you want to make some changes to Onos, yeah. like an API change to Onos, and then build your app against that API change. Yeah. Uh, so if you, with with the Maven built Onos project, uh, the artifacts that you build go into empty repo, and then you can reference them usually use, <coughs> using a snapshot tag. Um, we can ask Buck, or you can explicitly ask Buck to publish artifacts into an empty re into your local empty repo, which will make them available as Maven artifacts. For local Maven builds. So, for people that are building local apps with Maven and making Onos changes, they'll be able to to use that sort of me mechanism for lobbing bits across project boundaries. Um, and the last one is like if you build a new Loxygen or something and want to do testing before it gets published, you the pre-built jar is a good way to do local testing, publish it, and then uh, and depend on the official release version before it gets merged. Yeah. Sure. That'll help make builds more reproducible as well. So uh, I guess you can continue to think about those, and we'll come back to them if you want. Um, but I guess on the remaining work front, uh, Buck, prod, Buck can generate the IML files required to import Onos into your uh, IntelliJ. Cool. Um, it does not yet have support for Eclipse, but there is a $100 bounty on <laughs> Eclipse support. So if anyone really likes Eclipse, uh, you can go upstream <laughs> to Buck and make, make 100 bucks. It's a rhetorical question now. Um, <laughs> Your money. It's, yeah, it's there. This uh, 5x, the last bug bounty that we heard of from David Bainbridge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's one. Uh, the next, so for now, what we can do is we can import the project into IntelliJ, export some class class path files, and check those into the project. That's a temporary solution. Um, and when Buck project is capable of outputting Eclipse stuff, then uh, we can. We can throw those out. Is there a documentation on how to, uh, how to, how to, how to do, do the bug build with the Intelligent? It's like uh, to that. Buck yeah. project and then just open the top level line up file. Oh, really? This works. Wow. Amazing. Um, <laughs> shocking. And then awesome. the next thing is devs and RPMs. We wrote some, some stuff that does the repackaging. Um, this is actually mostly bash stuff based on artifacts. Um, you could take the output on this package and do some wrangling. I think. Uh, however, we haven't actually released devs or RPMs since 1.3.0. So my um, proposal here would be to wait until someone really wants it and then let them do it. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't use this as a, a blocker or a reason not to do it because it's unclear if it even works <coughs> uh, today. Um, and then the last thing kind of in the remaining work bucket is we use, uh, we run Sonar against our Maven project. Now you can have Sonar, you can set up Sonar builds by script. Um, so one thing we may want to consider is moving uh, over to the scripts that we require to run the sonar build. Um, if somebody wanted to tackle that, they could. Uh, I'm not sure how much. Maybe someone who likes using sonar um, could take that on as a, as a project. Um, <clears throat> so those are kind of the remaining things uh, that we wanted to make sure we, we discussed. Uh, if anyone sort of sees these as major blockers, uh, we could we could say that we're not going to remove the palms until these things are done, or if we say they're not major blockers, then we may we, we wouldn't use them to gate the deleting of the palms. Those things in Jira, if people want to take them on. Uh, I think the hmm, I'm not sure the no, eclipse, eclipse thing is in the bug uh, bug tracker, which is on GitHub. 
Um, oh, okay. The packaging stuff is, the, the, I don't think that's on JIRA. The, the sonar stuff is on JIRA. Um, there's a JIRA task for that. Yeah. Uh, yes. What about the uh, test reception issue I filed yesterday? Oh, uh, that's another bug. That's actually, bug that's, bug. that's an upstream bug. I don't know if it's been filed upstream, but maybe we should file it upstream if it's not already there. I, the other thing is it, it seems like... The problem is that um, if we remove the form file right now, then I have no way to So what, what you, what you, run the JIRA unit. What you could do is you could run them in IntelliJ, and IntelliJ will give you the exceptions. Uh, not all of them. Uh, for some unit tests that requires some package that requires web or REST API stuff, Oh, this cannot be run inside IntelliJ for some reason. Yeah. For example, okay. same routing. Sure. So do you want to add that to here as a blocker? Blocker colon. <laughs> uh, buck test eats. I think it's errors, right? It's, 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 it's no. There's two. There's two error error based classes. That are, there's a class not found and uh, okay. no no class that found error and no one too. That's actually caused by a illegal argument reception. I see. Okay, so. That's that's good to know. Thanks. The other the other thing is there's a um, there's a couple of problems that we have both with Maven and Buck right now. Um, so in Maven we have uh, in the incubator APIs Google protocol buffs used for gRPC, and we also have Thrift or BMB2. Um, <laughs> Buck we can add a few more of those uh, RPC APIs. Yeah, <laughs> Yang too. We've yeah. got we got one Yang. Yeah. Yang as well. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Yang, Rust, GPD, protocol buffers. We could add like so. So, or so, so protocol buffers <laughs> is actually the default serialization mechanism for gRPC. Um, anyway, point is, Buck has Thrift already. Uh, we can model a solution to protocol buffs off of um, Thrift or Yang, which we now have in Buck. Uh, the one thing here is we do have support for Thrift in Maven, but it's kind of a huge hack. Um, so we should probably fix that anyway. Um, it's, yeah. It's kind of, a, and, it, and the thing is, the hack was like, you know, running shell commands from a palm file, which is just <laughs> looks horrendous. It's like, if you specify your, your shell commands in XML, it's great. Um, so we should probably deprecate that and just do it know. right in Buck. Um, the other thing is we've, we've never fully gotten our package fully offline ready. Um, the deficiency, that we have right now is that we don't, there, Carafe actually has some features for which the artifacts are not included in the entry. So we need to kind of prepare Carafe better. Um, it requires just doing an analysis of the features that Carafe is going to start up and then downloading those artifacts and moving on with life. Um, this could be done in Buck or Maven. Um, it doesn't quite work in either, so the work's got to be done either way. Um, yeah, that'd be really nice. It always drives me nuts when it's like uh, oh, touching some crap from the internet. Maybe plugging for that. Carf was a main plugin which will give you some archive format named K R or something which. Oh, the Caraf archives. Yeah. Oh, for features. Huh. I haven't played with that. I've seen the K R thing, but I haven't played with it. Um, anyway, we could we could take a look at it. Um, there are some libraries that are pretty good at. at uh, parsing these feature files, like standalone utilities that are pretty good at parsing feature files and telling you where, where the artifacts are. So, um, I guess in the future enhancement section as well, one of the things that we realize is that when people are switching between branches, if they depend on different versions of Buck, um, you have to re-download it. Um, it took us about as much time to just cache those downloads as it did to write the bullet. So we just wrote the bullet and did it. <laughs> Um, we've wanted to make some enhancements to the uh, libgen, which we use to track transitive dependencies. Currently, they're done manually. Um, and then we want to add buck files to the archetypes. Um, so those are all things that we're not going to hold up the uh, palm deprecation for, um, but just things that we wanted to kind of make you aware of upcoming features. So, quick question: So, do, do is, is there any sort of work around here? Well, what happens is the test fails, but it doesn't tell you why. It's just a failure. So it's, it's a legitimate test failure, but it gives you no explanation of what failed. Okay, so what, what, 
Yeah. This is specific, those are specific workarounds. Those are specific the, tests, the right? The problem is the exception bubbled out of the library, and then the error that Buck reports the test exited before it wrote any. So output. can we can we provide our own up, upstream workaround workaround to upstream? We might be able to, might be able to fix it. I was going to take a look at it, but it's it's probably, often when it's probably just look at where Jane is being invoked, and then. That's what I was wondering. So I would like, I would like to, I would like to remove that. You know, I don't want to remove it just willy nilly, but I would like to make sure that it's. Now, what, what does it take to not to make it a blocker? Well, no, it's a blocker for the removal of the palm. And that's what I'm saying. I would like, to, <laughs> I would like to, uh, I would like it to become not a blocker. So what, what do we, what do we do? <laughs> so you, okay. Well, isn't the point of a blocker is that you come up with a workaround or a solution yes. and then you yes. so exactly. you're basically so you to un unblock it right now. I would, I would like to. I would like. To, what I would like to do is whatever. This is <laughs> blah blah. And what I would like to do is you know maybe tomorrow be able to say okay. Delete. No. Uh, <laughs> that's what Strike I meant to do. Strike that's three, what yeah. I meant to do. Okay. I see. Okay. So. Okay. So what is the blah blah? <laughs> <laughs> Don't write tests that fail this way. <laughs> well, the thing is that's a one word, that's a one word round, right? Because those are specific tests, right? Is there a way that's, to, that's there a way to right? Right? text them um, or identify them all? I understand so, it affects. I, I, I made a mistake in a test yep. that makes the test. Don't do it. Yep. Yes. So, so, so but the issue is you well, have without, a test. Without error message, I'm not able to tell. Sure. You can't tell what happens. It goes wrong. Okay, so clearly that, 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 that's one workaround is to, to avoid that or, or <laughs> fix it. But that's not really a viable one. What I would like well, to do is... It's sort of not because, because you don't know when the exception is going to happen. I have, that's, why it's <laughs> that's why it's a joke. That's why it's a joke. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. We should spend a little bit of time looking at yeah. how this thing is going to invoke. If it's a very quick fix, then instead of filing an upstream bug, we can just send an upstream patch request. Or maybe there's a debug flag which you can turn on that will at least dump the stack trace and give you an idea of what that's going on. But I just didn't get a chance to look at it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not really sure about the first background. Can we I use the groups of that thing, potentially the blocker? But yeah, so, well, no, the workaround is. <laughs> you need to import it into IntelliJ. Well, someone does. You don't have to. Intel, yeah, import it. Yeah, import it. Someone has to do it. Well, so what's not stated in here, uh, and uh, check in the workaround to get you to, to use IntelliJ. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, technically, a workaround is maybe not an acceptable or <laughs> one. But it's $100, you said. Oh, no, so by you in or into all the Well, no, it's not even R. It's it's a it's a buck bounty. Yeah, it's a Facebook. Yeah. Oh, it's a yeah. It's already a Facebook well. Would you have lunch in the cafeteria? Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> but it's probably really nice. So I guess um, one of the things we could do is we could say that uh, we'll check in the IML files and the class path files, and the reason we'll do both is because. Then, if somebody runs Buck project, it will see IML changes without the corresponding class path changes. And we can just ask the person who ran Buck project to export. This only really becomes an issue when you add new modules mm -hmm. uh, or change the dependencies of modules, which doesn't happen frequently. So, uh, for the time being, we could check in the IML and class path. And then, if you're looking through a change set that has IML, then just ask the reviewer oh, so to export the corresponding class path files. Uh, one thing we should probably do, though, is we that should just. To me, but I don't fully understand. So, so one of the things you probably want to double check is that the the, the class path files that, that um, IntelliJ exports are something that is reasonable. In yeah. So maybe I could generate some class paths and give them to Utah and see what to do. See if you like that. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me, is, it, is the IML is it a static thing or is it something built dynamically as part of that build? Well, it's based off of the dependencies in the bus build. So what it does is it looks the class path, the the IML files basically just specify um, the source directory, test directory, and then the pointers to all of the jars that are required. And so um, it's basically just an XML file that has some information about the module. 
and yeah. it won't change dynamically unless you change one of the upstream dependencies or need to generate a new one because you have a new module. So does that mean that you generated using Buffer as a check? It's generated the using Buffer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but we could check them into the source tree, and then if you had to run it again, it would just show up as a changed file. It would be fairly straightforward to write something, unit test something that invoked the buck project and then did a diff. And see, and it's it's just, a it's <laughs> different. Why is that a bad it's idea? It's a temporary. If it's thing. different, it says, hey, you didn't run the tool you were supposed to run. Or we could just say you took Andrew's the tool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like the idea of, I mean, I don't know, I guess I don't feel like no, sure, sure. the issue it's working dynamically generating content. Sure, I understand. I think everybody. I understand there's nobody. The nobody disagrees. Do, nobody so. disagrees with you. Uh, it's, it's just but a temporary work. If it's a bug, that's not, that there's a couple of people I think that are that say they're working on this. So Oaks, I think, is one of them. So if if it gets resolved in the next like month or two, then oh, the then then we just can just add the IML and class path back to get ignore and. So do you, does anybody see any other blockers in here? So I think so clearly I think it's this I, I, in, in my view uh, in my view this is a blocker. <laughs> Wait, where'd it go? <laughs> no, 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 I'm move, I'm moving it up. I'm moving it up. I think, I think right? the, it sounds like the Eclipse one is also a blocker. Yes, mm -hmm. blocker. Okay, but I don't as I I don't think that these two are blockers, there frankly. Blockers. They're, they'd be nice to have. So the only issue with sonar is we would have to turn it off. Yes, it's a it's a binary operation, would black have, and white. Correct. We would if we have no palm files, we have no something. We would have to turn it off. And uh, I think we survived for a month or so. Uh, we'll still we can survive. We can survive another month. Yes. Um, um, clearly, uh, the the goal is to enable it long run. Yeah. It's just that I don't think it should be blocking. So unless we're missing something else, I think we're just dealing with two blockers, and if we can address those, we have a reasonable workaround for those. Once that's taken care of, we should be able to. Any objections on that? Or any other blockers? So, what supports remote caching? Is there any plan of studying on that for the office? Oh, yeah, yeah put that in the bottom. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. Someone asked about that on the, on the list. Um, it, it supports both read write and, and um, read only caches. So, we'll, two things we might consider is putting a cache in a VM in the lab here, where anyone who's on our subnet could read write to it. And then we could also put like a remote cache somewhere on EC2, where people that are going to like where our Jenkins could just write yeah, artifacts yeah, into of. the read-only cache, so that people who are building on us remotely could just rely on cache artifacts. Um, but that would be something cool to set up. I don't think it'd be too hard. Um, it would just take some time who wanted to, to do it. Supposedly support. Oh, it. it it definitely does, because I think there are teams that, that use it. It's great when you have a lot of people doing a lot of builds in a local area. Yeah. Because then yeah, yeah, it's possible that if you check out someone's code, it's just your build's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really neat. It's a distributed build system, because somebody has, you know, Ray can build some piece of code, so I don't have to build it. Or yeah. distributes over everybody's laptops or servers. Yeah. Actually. Anybody else? Anybody comments? What are you going to do about version numbers? Version, Onos version. So, Onos version is specified in one high level file. I know, I understand, but I'm saying that. Um, so oh. like, like, what's, what's the version number? Are you going to grab the version number? When we, when we do this? Oh, you mean when we, we cut over? No. Is there a no. reason to? Well, yeah. I mean, it's a big change. Well, well so the version, change version number is more about the project API, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, the reason that, the reason I said that sort of somewhat facetiously is um, the I think we should in, in a future TST meeting have a discussion about moving Onos to follow semantic versioning. Yeah. yeah because yeah, currently we just follow our Onos versioning scheme, which is start with number one and then just increment the, <laughs> the minor number every time we have a release. Four months or whatever. It is. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think we should we should read the the semantic versioning specification which I'm sure some of you have done, including myself, and then try to abide by that. When, yep. we, when we see a release that is actually going to, to make non-compatible changes to APIs, we should, we should roll a major version. When we're 
making small enhancements, additions only, we can rev the miner, and then for, for updates or bug fixes, we can do the revision of this. But the way we've done it, some of our, our dot releases have really been at least minor and sometimes major releases. And by dot releases, I mean revision releases, uh, 171 or whatever, have sometimes been, been, uh, been at least minor. <laughs> and then for the other ones, uh, for a lot of our major releases, like, uh, like, which we've only assigned a new minor number two should have been the major numbers. So um, I think that's that's a sort of topic for another day. It's highly likely that we will roll the major version number, but not explicitly for this transition, more just because <laughs> the project needs it. But if it make you happy, Ellie, we'll roll it just for you. I think you should. I mean, it's a big change. <laughs> um, so this doesn't seem it, it, consonant with with semantic versioning, right? Which is that if you Unless you consider Maven part of the API, which I don't, I, well, I consider part of the build system, not the API. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is, as of the as of the roll to one eight snapshot, Maven is really no longer supported. It's just we we're tying up some loose ends. Right? Because if you look at the types of things that we're dealing with, uh, it's really just just basically just for integration into tools and um, and and you know oh, this this is. Not really have, has anything to do with this in implementation. Um, I mean, because are comfortable with. I mean, if you don't revision, then you're, you're, you're basically saying that like, the bug built on us is probably compatible with the native built on us. Which it is. Which it is. Yeah. 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 So the artifacts that are currently up on Maven Central for 170 and 171 yeah. were built with and published using both. I know, I realize. So I, I, I realize, I realize it's not, but not because I knew it was built with both. I realize it didn't work. So, <laughs> I, 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 want to, I want to suggest so the, the, part, the, part, the, part, the part that it didn't work for you was the fact that we didn't publish two palms that you were depending on. Right? I, it's still, still, right? <laughs> for sure, for sure. I, 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 I would like to address this in a bit. You know, perhaps you're suggesting that the uh, a problem in the. I mean, I, I would suggest that we just distinguish problems in the build system versus uh, you know changes in the in the core API. And I would also suggest that Buck is actually much better than Maven because Maven, you know, the way we were, you might say, using or abusing Maven, we were constantly <laughs> building on shifting sands, and that the builds were not reproducible at all. And with Buck, so it works correctly. Builds are reproducible. Same bits in, same bits out. So we should be in a much better situation than we ever were. Like Maven in the battle days, like man, you, you build it twice and they're totally different. And you're like, oh, dude. is it the same? You have, you have no confidence. Like things, random crap from the internet, all of a sudden breaks your breaks your own out. Yeah, it did but, four times last week. Yeah, unfortunately, that still happens. Um, <laughs> well, well it, 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 didn't, it didn't break the buckle. It's not Maven. No, it didn't break the buckle. It's not, it's not the Maven not, Yeah, it might not be Maven crap. But it's how we set up the defense. The, the usage pattern, which is clearly something it's an anti pattern for sure. <laughs> but uh, don't depend on other people's but, uh, I've seen, I think other people use this anti pattern as well, and it's, it's ma utter madness. Mm -hmm. Well, look at that. I mean, <laughs> so, I, I have no objections to revving the number, but to me, that's not a big deal. We can certainly do that, and we can, you know. Sure. We can rev the number. We can, it can be 2.0.0 snapshot. I don't think it really. Well, I, I don't, yeah. We can rev the next. So we can decide after. I'll, I think I'll, we should have a I'll, semantic versioning discussion before our next. Before ne exactly. Yeah, uh, I, I, I was going to say we can rev the number. I wasn't suggesting the major one. We haven't mm -hmm. rolled it for other things. I don't think should be running for it. That should be a deliberate uh, decision to make when we decide to, to sort of officially declare break and compatibility. But but I think I think I don't think that's necessarily what Ali was asking for. I think just he was asking for having a release version. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, you were not necessarily asking for a major number. You were asking for uh, just having a release version, right? So like one eight. Or were you asking for actually major number? But do you want but, the major number roll on with a dash snapshot? Because right now it's like it, it, right now we're in between releases, so the version number is kind of like a limbo version. Mm -hmm. I think what we should do is we should circle back and say. Um, before our next major release, what do we want? Like, given the fact that we've deprecated Maven, the fact that we've moved to semantic versioning, given you know whatever number set of facts we want to 
consider um, in how we decide to, to, to identify the correct version number for our project. I, I'm not sure if there's been a discussion or a consensus on you know how you want versioning to work. I mean, I, I'm kind of into semantic versioning, and I think it's good. But has that has that no, no, an official decision? We, we, no, no, we, we, need, to have this, we yeah. need to have this conversation. Yeah, because there are obviously alternatives. One is kind of arbitrary versioning, which is sort of what we've been doing in the past. Another part is calendar-based versioning, like Ubuntu, and there there are other version schemes as well that people might like. I, I'm into semantic versioning, but I, it might be good to reach consensus and have a formal statement on that. Yeah, that might be a good topic for a future. Yep. All right. So what we're we gonna do is we're gonna hold off on the removal of the pop out until uh, these two blockers are addressed. Uh, and the discussion about what to do actually for when when releasing. The pop outs can be re removed within the release after these are addressed. And then after we've removed them, then for cutting the next release we can decide on a version scheme sometimes between now and then. Is that right? There's no other comments or concerns or suggestions. There's no comment. I, I applaud that they give back. I, and more power to everyone. So the sooner we can say goodbye to the it's at tom.xml for better. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Oh, it's on us. On us. Tom. On us dash. What is it? What do they call it? In, in repo, they call it something, right? Yeah, they call it dot .com, even though it's an XML. We call it .com XML, and then when it gets published, it's just dot .com. Something dot .com, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I put on this .com and on this thing. Got it. Okay. All right. So thanks, everybody. It's a good discussion on both topics. We'll see you probably two weeks from now. Next week is almost built. <laughs>